Greetings, and welcome to another episode of Tom's Workshop. This is a, a video I've been wanting to make for a while. Um, sorry it took a little while, because I know on my other video about the uh, OGS 50W, I had uh, a few comments that were asking about uh, how I got it working with a certain other radio. Well, this ties into this video, because that other radio, it was more of a question, how did I get that radio actually working? And this brought me to a moral problem. You see, when I got the radio, it was just a cool little thing, it was whatever, and as I went down the rabbit hole and started playing with it, fixing it, and learning more about the project, I got a little bit more sad inside every day. And then finally, I kind of got it working now. And so before I figured I'd make this video, I'd reach out to um, Manuel, DL, to Mike Alpha November. He's the guy who created the hardware that is inside this rig. Well, the problem is he created design for the hardware. He had his own working models for it, and it was under a certain license where people could take it, build it, etc., etc., but it couldn't be used commercially. It couldn't be made commercially. And here's my radio made in China. It, like all of its relatives, the other USDXs, the USDRs, and they'll sometimes just call them uh, an 8-band SDR, they have a 3-band uh, handheld version, they've got a whole bunch of them. Well, they are what they are. And uh, the answer that I got from uh, Emmanuel was uh, pretty to the point. You see, I asked him for his blessing to make this video. And uh, he wrote me back, and he says, As long as you make it unmistakably clear that every one of these USDX, USDR, 8-band QRP transceivers is the epitome of Chinese product piracy, you have my blessing. And he continues, The battle is lost already. But the fight for the true USDX has just begun. 7.3's manual DL2 MAM. You know what? After what I've gone through with this radio, I've got at least 50 hours of trying to make this radio work. I've gotten to the point where it actually works okay. But there were times where I would get uh, people saying, what, they now make Fisher Price radios that go on shortwave and stuff like that. It was kind of kind of hurtful. And if you buy this junk, and yes, it is junk, and in a few moments I'm going to grab my cell phone and I'm going to film what I have to do to this thing to make it usable. You're going to understand what I mean and what the entire thing that uh, Manuel was trying to do and is actively doing with the new True USDX is to make it so that if it is made, and the new one, by the way, is under a different license, it can be made commercially. He's got requirements for you to submit samples, they have to be approved, then they can be made and you can sell them. And you know what, there's a whole bunch of stuff on his channel on YouTube. I'm gonna leave a link to his channel. You need to watch this stuff. You need to get an idea of what it was he was trying to do with this equipment. And it's pretty simple was trying to make a very energy efficient radio, a fun to use little radio, and did I mention little? It's tiny. And the idea was to have hardware. It doesn't matter who makes it, it's made to a blueprint. So that if there's software changes or if something needs to be fixed or you know updated, it can be applied to all of them because they're all the same. And what we ran into with this one, <laughs> by the way, I did manage to get the as built for this version 2.2. And it really was an eye opener because they forgot to put parts in it. They don't understand the basics of RF construction. And I feel ripped off. I won't get those 50 hours back. And I would have preferred to have, well, there it is, this, in this hand, going, 
This is Victor Echo 7, November Golf Kilo. At the beginning or end of some conversation, but no. No, 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 I was behind that keyboard. And I had a soldering station set up here. I had my oscilloscope uh, borrowed from a good friend and all sorts of equipment, just trying to figure out why on its transmit, it would splatter everywhere. Then came a firmware update. By the way, thank you, Rob C. That helped, and that really made this radio a lot nicer to use. Some really great features in that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then just the hardware end of it. I'm trying to figure out what's wrong. And then it turns out to be a missing resistor, which was causing me 80% of my problems. Why don't you join me? I'm going to take the cover off of this thing. I'm going to grab my cell phone. And we're going to venture through what I had to do to this radio. Maybe it helps you. And no, this isn't an endorsement to go and buy one of these. Yeah, that's another reason I had this moral problem. Because this video might be an endorsement for you to go and pay 150 Canadian dollars or something. Buy another one of these and fix it yourself and say, I got a great radio. When you really should be supporting the guy who made this possible a super energy efficient, fun to use, tiny little radio that works. Think on that. We'll see you inside. Okay everyone, we're going to start off at the back. I had this annoying problem where every time I would touch the radio, the screen would blank out. And every once in a while I would touch the radio, the screen would blank out, and it would start crying like a, uh, a baby or making all sorts of weird uh, de demonic sounds. <sighs> well, on closer inspection, they never grounded the radio, like all of the grounds in here, the power that comes into it, to the shell. So anytime I came near the microphone or the shell or the front panel, I would end up basically zapping the guts with static. This solution back here of the loop of wire between the two terminals was also required because in the circuit board, uh, front and back, there's no electrical connection. The anodized metal is not electrically conductive, and even though if we look on the edges of the circuit board, you'll see that shininess right there, runs along either side of the circuit boards, or circuit board, sorry, you can't see it in there, but it's supposed to make contact to a metal shell, but the shell is electrically insulated and it does not. So anyway, with that installed, I noticed that the receive became a little bit cleaner, which was odd, but I can actually touch my microphone and the radio and it won't crash anymore. Okay, that, uh, that really solved a, a little bit. We're going to go off now over to this little capacitor sticking up. It is connected between the ground pin and the MISO terminal. The MISO terminal leads right over to the Atomega processor and is also responsible for the microphone input to the processor. So by putting that there, I've now protected all of the ports um, that it receives microphone or audio in on from RF. The size of the capacitor I used was a, uh, what was it, uh, 47 nanofarad. Works really well. Uh, there's been some comments uh, online when I mentioned what I did uh, in a certain uh, Facebook group that I should have put it onto a, uh, a header so it could be plugged on and off should I do uh, some more firmware updates to it. And I must admit, four minutes after it was soldered in place, I had exactly that same thought. Let's go back to the back side of the radio. So very shortly after I got it, the uh, internal speaker stopped working. It came out of the uh, supplied microphone, but it didn't come out of the speaker. And that's because that El Cheapo plug there, that you can see a couple wires running across. Okay, I'm going to try to do this one-handed and get a pointer in there. That wire down there and that one right there go directly across the uh, socket. They basically use the other set of contacts inside of that 
uh, little um, earphone jack, if you will. The downside is the center pin now is hot with audio, but that pin or contact isn't used, so no big problem there. Uh, it's also my understanding that that should be a little bit more of a robust uh, contact set in there, so maybe it'll last for a while. Okay. For those people who might consider doing software updating, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, I definitely had to buy some hardware to do it, jumper cables and all that. It wasn't fun, scared the ever-loving daylights out of me. But that capacitor right there, C24, has to be removed on this particular version. I'll try to focus in a little bit there for you. There you go. And uh, once you've done your update, you can put it back in. There's no 100% known reason it's there other than possibly to stop RF from accidentally rewriting your CPU or something. Really not sure, but it's there, we put it back. Which brings us to the little thing beside it, R23, which is right there. It's recycled off of a Mac Pro motherboard. I needed something, 100,000 ohms. It's kind of an important part because that is part of the limiting and filtering and ballasting for the output power of your RF from that chip going straight over to the drive of your FETs, which are those three little guys over there. As you can see, all patience was used putting them in, twisted, who cares, huh? they're there, whatever. Um, if you want to see that particular circuit, this would be pin 14 on the Atmega. This is the missing resistor. It's 100,000 ohms. The remaining circuit consists of uh, these two resistors, a uh, 10 nanofarad capacitor to ground, and another 100,000K resistor, which I was able to confirm electrically is in place, but I <laughs> have yet to found where it's hidden. I'm thinking it might be on the back side of the board. But it's there. So we can see the output of here. Over more than half of it goes straight through this resistor to ground when it's in place. Then we have our little, I guess, uh, some sort of filtering to make sure that we're not getting anything really ugly going to uh, the transmit stage. And uh, then we have another 100,000. Uh, kilo ohm resistor and then basically straight into the gates of those FETs. Once I put that resistor in, I finally had the ability of, uh, how do you say, it? not the ability, the enjoyment of having the TX drive and all that work as advertised and suddenly I was able to get rid of a lot of the splatter problems also discovered, uh, uh, as far as the audio on transmit, uh, engaging certain filters helps and stuff like that. That's why I'm not going to say this radio is perfect or healed or anything like that, but at least it's now usable. I do intend to do some more um, uh, testing on this radio now for harmonics and stuff like that. Um, I guess we can give them a passing grade on the, their... Uh, filtering section there. We have eight bands and we have eight filters. It'll be interesting to see if they fall into legal limits or not. But uh, I want to say thanks for watching. In all seriousness, um, if you buy one of these, don't uh, expect any support from uh, um, Emmanuel or Guido. Um, you're on your own. There are some people working still with these and trying to get them operational, but you know what? It just, in the end, if you don't know what you're doing, uh, I really pity you because it's just gonna be a complete waste of money. Thanks for watching, I'm Tom, and we'll see you again.